Of course, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation, Casper. We're pleased to be here. Morten, our CFO, and myself will give you a brief introduction to Imperial, what it's all about, our customer base, what's happening in our market space, and of course, also uh, take a, a look at some of the numbers from Imperial. And we're happy to uh, to answer any questions that we might have, uh, that, we, that we might have from the audience. Uh, first of all, Imperio is in essence, you can say it's all about trust, it's all about transparency, and uh, we build a platform that makes it fairly easy, at least, as easy as possible for, for, cost, for, for companies to drive their compliance activities, uh, in essence, making them ready to be audited. So this is about the risk management part, the internal control setup that you have in organizations, uh, whether large or smaller organizations, but also the need to be able to document what you're doing and to have the continuous ongoing reporting on where you are with these activities. Our customers are uh, some of the very large global companies, such as uh, some of the very large automotives in Germany, uh, say Volkswagen and Porsche, for instance, and also Siemens and some of the very large Danish list listed companies, family owned companies, and a number of smaller companies where they still have this uh, desire both to, to be transparent and to be very trustworthy towards uh, the environment they are they're working in um, or they are in highly regulated environments. Um, I'll come back to uh, a little bit more about how we go to market. First, I'd like to say that what we do for these companies is in essence, we help them with Documenting the, documenting the compliance activities that could be related, related to tax compliance, financial compliance, could be related to ESG, IT, etc. Uh, often with a platform where they populate it, but also, as we will come back to a little bit later, with more populated solutions where we uh, present the uh, new frameworks to the customers, making it easier for them to get started with, for instance, the CSRD, which is uh, pretty much on people's mind uh, these, these days. Looking at how we go to market, we have a strategy that we call Lend and Expand, and we do that through various channels. So first of all, we team up with partners, and those can be what is uh, known as the big fours, so say KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, etc. cetera. Um, and then also niche players in, in different markets or could call Massage a niche player. It's still a top 10 within the global uh, audit and uh, tax advisory community, uh, or to be more local, uh, the Basico, for instance, in, in Denmark. These partners, they expose us to enterprise customers. They help set up the compliance environments for these customers, and they help do the implementations. Um, they account for approximately 50% of our AR. On the other hand, we also do the direct sales, where we have our own sales force that, uh, that is responsible for the other 50% uh, approximately, and where we have the opportunity to, of course, service still some of the enterprise customers, but also enabling us to go to a broader segment um, that is super relevant to us, it's super relevant to the customers, but not necessarily where you would always see the big four each partners. Then we have the expansion. So that's back to the land and expand. For us, it's about really getting a foot in the door, getting started with the customers, could be within one compliance domain, then expanding into other domains, could be within one entity of a company, expanding into more, or into one country and expanding into more. Uh, we have a uh, we have some pretty strong metrics with a very low churn and a really good uplift percentage. So we came out of Q1 with a net revenue retention rate of 118%. If we just uh, move forward to the next one, uh, to give you a little bit of insights on the market we're in, we're primarily targeting the North, uh, Northwestern uh, European market. Uh, I'd say, as I heard in one of the former presentations, that the opportunities are actually all around. So there are so many different uh, regulatory requirements in different markets. So this is based on us being uh, approximately 40 employees, focusing our efforts uh, in, uh, in markets that are pretty, 
close to us. Um, what we see in the market is that we see increasing regulatory requirements. So new directives coming from the EU, but also in other markets, local directives, whether that be uh, on supply chain in Germany or supply chain in uh, or tra tra transparency in Norway or lots of different uh, regulatory requirements being added. I wouldn't say to the compliance burden, but I said it anyway, but the compliance activities for our customers. Also, of course, as the uh, the level of interest from the broader group of, of, of stakeholders, and that could be uh, employees, it could be customers, it could be investors, uh, being really interested in how are the companies actually doing? Are we sure that they're not greenwashing? Are we sure that they're doing the right things and that they actually do what they say they do? Also, we see the spillover effect from what initially happens to the large companies. We usually see that eventually it goes uh, towards the lower segments. And that's uh, the, the EU CSRD directive is a really good example of that, where we see Initially, it's for the large, larger companies, the listed companies, and then over the coming years, it'll be applicable for everyone. Then there's, of course, the speed of change and the complexity within the organizations, and they need something that's pretty agile and where they can uh, change the way they set up their compliance uh, environments to new realities happening uh, all the time. So that's uh, why it's so important to be someone who's pretty agile and who can really help the customers uh expand into new areas and also uh change the the current area the current setup to to the new reality then i think it's fair to say that there's a, an increased focus on on cost um so probably going into recession uh, a lot of people are holding the reins a bit and uh, we've also heard about that in earlier presentations today that uh, there you might see some longer sales processes etc uh, some people trying to get all everything in one uh, on, on not, not that many tech solutions. Um, so we really we really see that there's a driver there for having some something that's affordable, that's flexible, that scales into different uh, areas, etc. And then last but not least, the peace of mind bit. So actually going to bed at night, whether you're the employee who's responsible for some compliance activity, or you're the leadership team, or you're the non-executive board, knowing that. They did what they wanted to do, and they can actually document it so we can go to sleep and uh, have a good night's sleep. So that's some of the market drivers that we see in uh, in our business. Yeah, and then uh, a little bit about the numbers. Uh, in Impero, we came out of the Q1 23 with uh, an annual recurring revenue of uh, 25.3 million. Uh, that's the live AR that we changed to that methodology in connection with our uh, or actually in connection with our Q1 report we changed here at the, at the year end. Uh, so it's only revenue we include in the ARR that is also recognized as revenue. Uh, so the uh, live ARR has uh, grown 40% compared to uh, Q1 uh, 22. Um, and uh, if we look at uh, the reported revenue going out of Q1, uh, we landed at 6.2 million, which is a 46% growth compared to the same period uh, last year. Looking at our uh, uh, cash burn and our uh, burn multiple, then uh, as we communicated uh, in connection with our annual report that the aim was to see an improvement during uh, 2023, we already see that. Uh, going out of uh, 2022 uh, with uh, a burn multiple around three, uh, we are out of Q1 uh, uh, around two in our burn multiple. That would say the uh, negative free cash flow from operating activities and investments uh, divided by the uh, net ARR growth we see in the same period. So uh, it costs us uh, two uh, kroner in, uh, in a cash burn uh, every time we generate one kroner in new ARR. Uh, and with the uh, uh, net revenue retention rate we have at the 118%, that actually uh, um, compares to that one uh, krona in new ARR uh, this year is actually seven krona uh, five years from now. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it does make sense to uh, invest in, uh, at least that's our take, that based on these multiples, that it does make sense to invest in uh, the growth uh, at the states where we are uh, currently. 
Uh, as mentioned, our net revenue retention is 118%. It's uh, composed of an uplift of 19% and a churn of uh, 2%, which is uh, really, really low. And we are very pleased uh, uh, with that, uh, of course. Uh, and um, of course, something we, uh, we work to continue to improve. But uh, of course, 2% is very low. So as communicating connection with the annual report, uh, we may also see a slight increase uh, during um, but keeping it at a, at a, at a low level. Um, our outlook, which we uh, maintain, and we communicated that in connection with the Q1 uh, reporting, uh, annual recurring revenue of 29 to 33 million, uh, comparing to a, a gross rate between 28 and 46 percent. EBITDA uh, also still expected to be in the range of minus 13 to minus 11 million, comparing to an uh, EBITDA of minus 17 in uh, 2022. If we look at the, uh, the same numbers in the, in the waterfall overview, uh, we started out 12 months ago with 18.1 million in ARR. And of course, that has then grown to the 25.3. Uh, the churn has been uh, only 300,000 in this 12 month period, where we at the same time have had uplift of 3.5 million and new customers coming in of 4.3 million. So uh, also numbers that supports the land and expand uh, strategy uh, that uh, I could just uh, refer to. Thank you, Morten. Uh, looking a little bit on the, or focusing a little bit on the, the focus areas that we are uh, working hard to, uh, to support in, uh, in support of our continued growth. Uh, it's really important for us to uh, work with the partners on increasing the level of automation. Uh, so, we work with the partners on, help, <coughs> sorry, on helping the customers extract data from other systems, apply them uh, as automated controls, get the, the right data, the correct data, whatever it might be, back in the original system. So being part of a larger e ecosystem. Um, and that's something where our partners, they have their lighthouses or their tech departments where they really work closely with their customers on making this uh, possible. Then we uh, listed a few years back, mainly as a platform where we have these uh, large corporates that usually build their own uh, uh, frameworks based on, of course, whatever uh, regulation they need to adhere to. Uh, but we also see an increased need for supporting even the bigger companies with some uh, more templated offerings where it might be uh, within tax technology, so helping the customers with the risk directories and control setups so that they, they make sure that they uh, build the right framework without necessarily having huge projects with the big four um, partners. It's also within CSRD, helping companies now go through the double materiality analysis and figuring out what are the requirements that they really need to work on in the CSRD and how do they then, by the way, afterwards, uh, close the gaps and make sure that they also run the controls they need to, to be able to be audited on uh, their efforts within this uh, topic. Also for say month end closing, we do a joint project with the Basico in the Danish market on supporting companies with a standardized offering for how you can actually improve or uh, make your month end closing more efficient so that you can really uh, save your time and energy for, for other stuff. Then we're also working on expanding our partner network. So that means working with more divisions within our current partnerships, but also expanding into new partnerships that allows us to either go towards new markets or towards new segments in the markets we're already in. Um, and last but not least, the integration bit. So really being a part of a larger ecosystem, uh, opening Imperial towards other platforms, and that's with uh, different APIs, some of them being tailored for uh, one solution, say, say an, an uh, API towards Power BI, making it uh, possible for the customers to do some really uh, strong reporting in the Power BI platform based on the uh, data from um, Imperial but also uh, working with our partners and with our customers 
on creating integrations to also ERP systems, etc., which is a much more tailored uh, way to do it, but also super interesting and really supporting both the growth within our current customers, with new customers, and of course, also improving the stickiness of uh, the Imperial platform. So those are the, the main focus areas that we are currently working on. A few examples here, a landing page on the German template-based solution, and then the uh, what we call CSRD Simplified goes well with Compliance Simplified, uh, the, the most recent um, add-on to, uh, to our solutions. Just to a quick uh, one minute uh, finish here, um, our growth foundation is, of course, that we have a proven platform that we have shown that we can uh, attract new customers and th that we can expand them and that they're really happy with the ease of use that they find with Imperial. Um, it's also that we can see that we can really leverage even more on our partners. So that's expanding into new areas, as I just mentioned, and grow that even further. And then, of course, we've shown over the past five years a 47% uh, um, CAGR, which is uh, a pretty decent uh, uh, level to, uh, to move on from. So that was a very brief uh, intro to Imperial, and uh, I think we made it at 20 minutes, Casper. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, let's take some questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what is the size of the primary target customers you have? So is that in terms of size of company or? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's not I'll, what I'm part of the question, questions. but you can make your own uh, definition. Yeah. yeah, I think when we're looking at the partner channel, most of the customers that they talk to, they are pretty large corporates. While for our own direct sales channels, we also have these conversations with large corporates, but we actually also have a lot of conversations with mid-sized companies who are looking to make this easier, simpler, get out of their Excel tools or get out of a uh, environment with different tools and get it all bundled into one uh, platform. So those could actually be from, uh, say, look at European Energy. That was a reference that we uh, mentioned early on. It's still a fairly, uh, it's a decent sized company, but compared to uh, Maersk or Volkswagen or whatever, it's a really small company. But we have a huge uh, potential with these customers in terms of helping them improve their efficiency in month end closing, improve their transparency, improve their work with ESG, making sure that they are ready for uh, all the data uh, scrutiny that you will see on, uh, on, in, on that agenda going forward. So that's actually a, a twofold uh, strategy here. Okay, so maybe I can board it a bit out in terms of you know uh, revenue or ARR. Do you have any boundaries between how low you go down in the segment or how, how high you can say you go and up in the, in the in the segment? Could we say we're not mm -hmm. um, nah, necessarily they're, they're, picky? We're not necessarily picky uh, if we have the right solution that uh, serves the customers, uh, but it's, uh, I would say, uh, if you go below 100 million in uh, in revenue, then we are probably not as relevant. Then it's probably a comprehensive uh, mm -hmm. implementation you should do. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, there is, uh, and of course, there are also exceptions to that, uh, but, uh, but uh, a, a decent size uh, is, is, is probably our target group so yeah. yeah yeah and do we have any very small customers in terms of ar from one customer for example yes. what, what what is the lower boundary that you have here well we actually have uh, we have customers in i say uh, there's a there's a big uh, span from the smallest yeah. to the largest and we have small customers that come in at a very low ticket size and i said like let's say 50000 kroner mm -hmm. and they what they do is that they make sure that very often they're in a position where they want to grow their company, they want to scale, and they want to set it up correctly from the very uh, beginning. So that's why they go with us. They might go with uh, uh, one of our partners and say, we need to build this correct because we want to bring ourselves in a position where we do the right thing the first time. And we've actually had some, have some of those examples where we had a customer, there were six employees, they got sold. 
a few years later for a huge amount. Uh, but they just wanted to build it correct from the very, very first uh, steps they took. So that was that was actually a super cool example of, uh, I think, even slightly lower ER, yeah, but uh, mm, yeah. but just yeah. to support them in, in building their the right processes in their finance team. Yeah, cool. Um, and then we have another question. Maybe I should divide it in two. But uh, starting mm -hmm. with the first part of it, can can your software be used across all markets without adjustments when looking at scalability? That's a yes. Clear yes. Okay. And the second part of it, is it expected that Imperial will enter new markets or countries over the coming years? Um, we haven't said anything particular on that, but we have said when we did the IPO that we want to expand in Northwestern Europe. Uh, we have over the uh, past year or so had customers both in new countries in Northwestern Europe, also actually in say, Singapore, for instance. Uh, and I think it is reasonable to believe that we will see uh, new market entries. But that is, of course, a decision, uh, discussion that's ongoing as we also roll towards a new strategy period following uh, the IPO back in April 21. And that's a process that we're running with the board and with our team, of course. Uh, so more on that as soon as we're ready.